This is Bumper to Bumper Radio, the car show. Drive in anxious and cruise out confident. With the best automotive information for your vehicle, Bumper to Bumper, helping you and your car feel better. And now your hosts, Matt Allen and Dave Riccio. Well, good morning, everybody. Happy Saturday. Even though it's Matt's birthday, we're not going to talk too much about that. Welcome to Bumper to Bumper Radio on Fuel System Day. I am Dave Riccio. He is Matt Allen. We are your KTR car guys. Heard every Saturday from 11 to noon right here on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. At Bumper to Bumper Radio, we're helping you, the motoring public, have a better overall car experience. If you've got car questions, we've got answers. So we encourage you to give us a call. we got no texting today. A little bit of internet snafu going on, seems like. So you're going to have to call us at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTAR. Today on the Bumper to Bumper Roadmap, email of the week, open phones, fuel systems, the rules have changed. And this was prompted by a phone call from Larry last week in Sun City with a 2012, I believe it was a GMC Equinox, uh, LTZ or something like that. And he was in getting his 14,000 mile oil change. And they said, Hey, Larry, you really do for a fuel <laughs> system cleaning. I hate to break it to you, but uh, it needs to be done. It's going to be $349. And it just didn't sit well with him, you know. And, and that Joel and, and Matt and I, we, we thought it was a little premature for that vehicle, but we don't have all the facts. So we thought, you know what? Let's do some homework. Let's make some phone calls. Let's see what kind of the the rules are out there and what people are doing. So, Well, Dave, well, and I go back to what we practice in our in my shop, but to him the answer was, again, you probably don't need it, but there could certainly be a case for that, for that mileage of cleaning at 15,000 miles to do those services on certain cars. But you've got to know which car that is, and you've got to know that you're at the shop that's doing the, the service for your car because they know you you have a propensity to have problems rather than just making sales. So, you know, let's start the different types of fuel systems and, and fuel injection. We'll start with carbureted cars. We don't see many of them anymore. I read about one once. Yeah, but <laughs> carbureted cars have carbon buildup problems too. Carbon is, well, we need to, I need to back up even further, I guess. The reason that we're cleaning fuel injectors or cleaning throttle bodies is because we have carbon buildup inside the engine on the back of the valves, in the throttle body, in the intake manifold. That's just going to happen. There's not a lot you can do about it. It's kind of like your fireplace at home. You're going to burn the wood. What do you do? <laughs> you get a chimney sweep because that builds up that carbon in, 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 your, in your chimney. So we need to eliminate. That's a killer for an engine. Now, we had that with carbureted cars. In the old days, they used to pour water down the, down the cylinders to clean that out. I've seen people put transmission fluid mm. um, using uh, GM had top engine cleaner. It used to just rev the engine and start pouring that stuff in until it just choked out the engine and let that sit. Well, we don't do that anymore. Then well, you, have, from- you have your throttle body fuel injected car. We don't see a lot of those. It's That's like a glorified the- carburetor. Yeah. yeah, the injectors are, are sitting there at a central location. You still get some carbon buildup there. Then you have your port fuel injected car. That's where there's one fuel injector for every cylinder, and the and the injector is in the intake manifold and injecting that fuel just right into the just before the cylinder on you know goes over the intake valve and into the cylinder. And now we've got direct injection, very high pressure, about seventeen hundred to two thousand pounds or higher, and that fuel injector goes directly into the cylinder. Spraying fuel. Right into the fireplace. Yeah. <laughs> like standing there with a the gas can. No. Well, I mean, what the heck are they recommending, Larry? You know, we got to talk about a fuel system and what is there. you got a fuel tank in the back. It's got a fuel pump in it. And you've got fuel lines that run up the engine. On the older cars, it was more typical along those lines to have a fuel filter. A lot of cars have gone away from a you know, inline fuel filter. They and, still have a filter. The A modern car or a really late model... They still have a filter, but it's in the gas tank and part of the pump and typically not serviced. In the old days, we'd change them out every 30,000 miles if that was what was needed. Right. And then those fuel lines run up to the engine, and then they go into the fuel injector. There's a fuel rail and mm-hmm. then fuel injectors, and there's different types of fuel injection that we talked about. But pretty much that's all that's there. 
So Larry was talking about a fuel fil- He mentioned fuel filter. And he may or may not have one. May or may not have we, one. We see that on Suburbans and GM products. The flex fuel ha- doesn't have one, and the non-flex fuel vehicle has a fuel filter. So it's hit or miss on whether your car has a serviceable fuel filter. So, and then cleaning the injectors sounded like that was part of it. And he didn't talk about any sort of carbon cleaning, but they specifically addressed the fuel system needed cleaning, Mm -hmm. you know, 14,000 miles. It did feel young to me, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, I talked to Joel Bartko, the guy that was on the show with us last week, and he says, you know, Dave, you know, when this stuff first started coming around, a lot of these fuel injection cleaning kits and stuff, he thought, he said, I thought it was, you know, just a joke, really. Snake oil. Snake oil, a profit center. And, uh, you know, some people still believe that and are still preaching that. But we'll have these cars come into our shop. Toyota Avalon was the example he gave me. 100,000 miles, car would fail emissions. Wouldn't pass. Mm -hmm. Nothing really wrong with it. They did a complete, uh, you know, decarbonization and fuel injection cleaning. Car went down there. Perfect. Right through. Yeah, big time. I mean, in the late 80s, mid 90s, I used to fix, when I was a tech working on cars, my specialty was drivability. I would fix cars that would have no other problem except they failed emissions. BMWs, Crown Victorias, Hondas. You do a, a what we call what we use in our shop, my shop, motor vac. It's where we replace your fuel system with our fuel system and bypass yours, and we run this cleaner through for an hour, hour and a half, depending on the severity of of how dirty it is. And the car would blow zeros. Back when they used to measure the tailpipe, there's nothing. I mean, you could. Wrap your lips around that tailpipe, and <laughs> if you could take the take the air volume, oh. it's not even going to kill you. It would you, make them perfectly clean. If you're a car guy, you might do that once in a while. <laughs> it's a pretty good buzz. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, but I'm thinking as a listener right now, and I'm saying you guys are throwing out a bunch of terms like valves and injectors and tune port and multi-port and throttle body and crossfire. It doesn't mean anything to me. So I think you guys need to know when you need one and then what it is. You know, so why would you need it? You know, so why would Larry need one? Um, and because there is, you know, with the direct injection cars, we know that carbon is a problem. So if you got a guy that's familiar with your car, let's say it's a Volkswagen or an Audi, and you're at 15, 20,000 miles, and he's saying, let's, let's do a decarbon on this thing, it's not premature. No. Because the, the problems that we're having, because it's a relatively new technology. And the problems that we're having are they're, they're starting to be big and expensive. So we know it's going to save you money in the long run. So it's not just one of those things you're being sold down at the auto shop. This is going to save you money in the long run. So that's a direct injection car. And you, can, you should find out. You should learn, do I have a direct in- injection car? And that's really going to be anything 2006 and, and newer. It started in 2006 predominantly. And you, what you can really see, the manufacturers are proud of that. So if you have a Hyundai or a Kia, mm. it says GDI in the back. Gasoline direct injection. Is that what that means? <laughs> I think so. <laughs> that, 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 I, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm going with. So they're proud of it. I mean, this is this technology is born of needing fuel economy, mm. better fuel economy, more efficiency, more power out of a smaller displacement engine. But we talked about this. So the reason that there's carbon buildup or the problem with the carbon is, let's just say you have a 30 millimeter opening. Or you take your your index finger and thumb and, and make that OK sign, that circle. Mm. For each cylinder, that's about the size of the port that's allowing air into your engine. And as you, the carbon builds up, and, that, and the carbon's just a byproduct of combustion. It's going to happen from burning the fuel, from the crankcase ventilation, the vapors off the oil rising in, going through the through, uh, EGR gases, the exhaust gas that gets reburned. So picture that 30-millimeter opening, if that's the size of it. That carbon starts to restrict that to the point now where maybe you can barely stick your thumb in that hole. Mm. That's choking off the engine. It's like trying to breathe through a wet sock while you're running. It doesn't work. Coffee so, straw. Co- so we, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so we've got to clean that. And there's various times to do it. So you ask Dave, when do you do it? Some of the symptoms that you might have might be pinging or detonation, you know, light acceleration or going up a, a hill and you get that <laughs> rattle from the engine. If you're not using the right fuel, the first thing to do is get the proper fuel in the car. Which, by the way, you'd be surprised at how many cars require or want premium fuel, and the owners don't even know it. Right. So that would be one symptom. The other would be maybe you just have a car that's a little sluggish, starts a little bit rough. Nothing else wrong with it. There's nothing, you know. There's no check engine light. The spark plugs aren't due for maintenance. There's just nothing really wrong. It's just not running fit as a fiddle. It could be running yeah. better. 
That would but I don't think people realize the deterioration. They buy the car new and it runs great, and over time it deteriorates, like you say, a mattress or a pair of shoes. They just get it just goes away. Yeah, and you just don't know it because it's denigrating with you. But Dave, in this case with the fuel injection system, you've got to remember. You've got a computer in there working its tail off, and it's constantly adjusting to make up for these deficiencies that the car is starting to gain as it grows mile, as the as it gets more miles on it. So you can't always know it. It does a good job of hiding the problem. When we come back, we've got Matt and Tony at open lines at 602-277-5827, 602-277-KTR. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. My pappy said, son, you're going to drive me to drinking if you don't stop driving that hot rod Lincoln. Bumper to Bumper on News Talk 92.3 KTAR. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio here along with Matt Allen, and today we are talking about fuel injection, fuel injection cleaning. Are you being bamboozled when they tell you you need one at the auto shop? We've got open lines. You can call in regard to anything at 602-277-5827. And I didn't even know it was Matt's birthday today until I got in here, and he said it was his birthday. It and, is, Dave. And how old are you? 44. 44 years old. I'm 36, so you are eight years that older would be, than me. You, you graduated in basic math, too, did it looks like, Dave. Huh? <laughs> I did. You know, he knows what the IROC is. <laughs> I have no well, idea. Know, my youngest daughter, her birthday was supposed to be, or her, her due date was my birthday. I was really hoping for that, because then I would never have another birthday, just at right about the right time, but... But she came 10 days early. But then I have to say happy birthday to uh, Tyler Barry. That's a friend of mine's kid who's we have share the oh, same birthday. Right. 30 years apart. So he's not listening, I'm sure. But happy birthday. I don't even anyway. know. What is the date today? January 25th. January 25th. All right. All right. That's right. That's good to know. Well, so, I think I'm still confused. You know, what is a fuel system cleaning? What what What's it going to cost me? How often do I need to get it done? Well, first we were talking, I mean, we talked about, covered the different types of fuel systems, and what we're talking about is carbon buildup in the engine. And, and, and you know, Dave, it's not necessarily that we want to clean the fuel injectors. It's mm. that we're using the fuel injectors to deliver the cleaner that cleans the carbon from the engine. So, again, some of the symptoms that we started to cover was pinging, or sluggish running. Maybe there's just something not right about the car. It doesn't get the best gas mileage, but there's seemingly nothing else wrong. Preventative maintenance. Now, we talked about Larry, I think it was, at 15,000 miles. Probably not on that GM product. Mm. But if you have a car that's direct injected, you have a Mini Cooper, a BMW, a Kia, Mm, Kia, Volkswagen or Hyundai, or Volkswagen or Audi, Kia, Hyundai, anything with direct injection... Those are worse and have a higher propensity for carbon buildup because the where the fuel is being injected. On a port fuel-injected car, it was going into the outside of the cylinder. So that fuel, as it was being injected, was constantly washing the valve. We still had carbon buildup, but not as much. You take away that fuel wash with a direct injected, in, direct injected engine, and now there's nothing there to help wash that engine. Another time that you want to do... Uh, carbon cleaning or fuel injector cleaning is after or right before you have a catalytic converter replaced. Something made that catalytic converter go wrong. And if you look at the warranty on new catalytic converters, they say you have to clean the fuel system or we're not warranting this converter. Mm. When your car is pinging as a result of, of carbon buildup or not running properly, it creates NOx, nitrates of oxygen, and that is a byproduct of combustion. That will kill the cat. Well, the other thing is just fuel economy. You got a car, everything seems to run good, but your fuel economy is falling up by one mile, you know, one, <laughs> one mile per gallon, two miles per gallon, and you're starting to see the deterioration. Uh, I know uh, a friend of mine, Jim, on a suburban, yeah. he did a you know fuel system cleaning, and before I don't think he was a believer, but he picked up a couple miles per gallon just he, by doing that. He did. Now he did the type. There's now there's a couple different types of cleaning. You can inject the fuel or the cleaner through the fuel rail of the car. That's typically what you would call fuel injector cleaning. So we're going we're gonna to disable the pump in the fuel tank, mm-hmm. and we're going to connect right to that fuel rail 
that's delivering to the fuel injectors, and we're going to plug in the chemical there. With our gas tank. Now, some people would use the can, I call it cheese whiz, and I also call it a waste of money. <laughs> they screw on, you know, the car wash is good for this, or, or you know, if, if you can get it done at a quickie place and you're in and out in the hour, don't waste your money. I always right. tell people, go donate to charity. You'll get more out of it that way. <laughs> it, will, it, it, will be, it will be better. Your money will go better places if, if you go donate as opposed to the, the, quick, the quickie <laughs> joint. Um, the other, so we're we're going to inject through the fuel rail. We're going to clean the injectors. We're going to clean the valves. Now, in a direct injected engine, we want to fog, or we're going to spray a cleaner in a very fine mist into the throttle body of the engine. That's going to clean the throttle body. It's going to clean the intake manifold, and it's going to clean the back of the valves where you never get any fuel. This is worth the cost because I think someday it's going to give us cancer. We're going to find out we got cancer because we <laughs> yeah. use this fogging on yeah. your intake because this is stuff will peel the paint right off your walls. <laughs> yeah, it's it's really gnarly, nasty stuff, but it just needs to it just needs to be occasionally occasionally done. On some cars, as early as fifteen, twenty thousand miles, they're having problems, and you don't want to wait for the problem, but you also don't want to do it too early, and that's why it's just so important the relationship with your shop. So they're giving you it. I get my shop, Virginia Auto Service. We repair the car. I call it custom service. Mm. You don't just – everybody that comes in doesn't get a fuel injector cleaning and an oil change and One a power steering flush. All. It's made we, – we're going to service the car for your needs. Right. Makes sense. Well, yeah. we've got to get to the phone calls. We've got Matt in Queen Creek on a 2002 Ford Excursion. Go ahead, Matt. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, it's got a 7.3 diesel in it. Okay. And – uh if I don't plug it in at night, it's not starting in the morning. I've done the glow plugs, the glow plug harness, um, you know, everything I can think of what would cause that. Well, I mean, diesel is not my specialty, but there's a number of different things that computer and that fuel system needs to see. And since you say cold, the first thing we'd be wanting to look at is the temperature sensor of the engine, the engine coolant temperature sensor and the air intake temperature sensor, and make sure that those two components are telling the computer the truth. We, for example, if it's 40 or 30 degrees outside and the computer is telling the engine and the fuel system that it's 90 degrees, it's not going to deliver enough fuel. So that that would be one the first place to look at. I have an excursion that has the 6 liter. That thing ran horrible cold. If I plugged it in, it ran really well cold and started. It, I had a bad fuel injector. So just one fuel injector. Uh, I, I, I have a feeling it's going to be something related to temperature, obviously, with the, with the computer sensor or a starvation. Maybe the, the fuel system can't deliver enough diesel fuel to make the car happy when it's cold. So it's just that's, that's something that's going to need some testing. Well, thanks for, so much for the call, Matt. We're going to go to Tony quickly in Glendale on a 2007 Hyundai Sonata. Go ahead, Tony. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, hi, uh, and happy birthday, Matt. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I have a, uh, a bushing worn out on the right, on the front right control arm, and and I, I took it to get an estimate, to get it fixed, and it seems kind of steep, charging over four hundred dollars to do so, and they will not give me details as why it's costing so much. I went online, researched the parts, and then the parts don't go come up to $100 together. I mean, is there something else they're doing that I'm not aware of They won't tell me? Well, first thing, I guess, I guess if they're not telling you, that's the first, the first problem is why they're not yeah. being transparent, if you will. But a couple things, we might have to get into greater detail uh, in, in a minute here, but you could replace the entire control arm. That car might be where you could replace the just the control arm bushing. But if they're doing the job right, you also should do an alignment on that car after replacing it. And then you got to remember, you're always going to find something on the internet cheaper. Cheaper. Absolutely. So sometimes you can buy stuff on the internet cheaper than we can buy it for. And and we're going to make a profit on the part. So there's 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 a there's some cost there. There's labor, there's sales tax. We've got to warranty that. So that's a lot of the reason it could be $400. But I don't think that's unreasonable. When we come back, we're going to take an email of the week, and we got open phones at 602-277-5827, 602-277. KTR, you're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, 
Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I am Dave Riccio, here along with the birthday boy, Matt Allen. Thank goodness he's not wearing his birthday suit. I, would not I got want... it on underneath, Dave. <laughs> I would not want to see that. So we're taking your phone calls. We've got Frank and Ron in open lines at 602-277-5827. And uh, last week we had a couple phone calls, Larry on the fuel system question. And then we had Paula in Scottsdale. And if you're listening, Paula... You were talking about the whining in your power steering pump on your 2005 Hyundai. I think it was a Sonata. But uh, they, they just couldn't get it right. And uh, we described the screen in the bottom of your power steering pressure reservoir. I'm bringing it up because I think it's the one time I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so this morning I'm, I'm sitting on the can. And <laughs> <laughs> on the back of my can is a copy of the library. It, <laughs> is a copy of uh, Automotive Import Car Repair. That's what I read in my spare time. So I picked it up, and I'm flipping through it. Oh, there's the Hyundai in the power steering reservoir and the plug screen and the wine, and I thought, it was wow. in the, It was in the tech tip section. So, so all I could do was think about Paula while I was sitting on the can. <laughs> <laughs> Dave, that's an all-new low. I don't even know what to say now. <laughs> I want to touch briefly on the call, back to the call before the uh, – before the break, he was had his car in somewhere, and it was $400 uh, to replace a control arm or a control arm bushing. I'm not sure which one it was, but mm-hmm. something in that corner of the car. What was more disturbing about that is is the shop was unwilling to or could not properly articulate or explain what what the costs associated were. It was just 400 bucks, And I got the impression of why is it $400? Because it is. Mm. I don't know why, but that's not an unreasonable price. And in my shop, we, we if we can get just the control arm bushing, we'll put the control arm bushing on. But there's certain cases where the the car, that that control arm might have a ball joint attached to it. It might have another bushing, and a lot of times you can't service the one bushing, but you can service the other. So now if you start getting in a car with 90, 100, 130,000 miles on it possibly. Maybe a whole control arm because it's got a new ball joint. You're going to fix that differently than maybe the 60,000 mile car. There's, you know, you go put the, the one bushing in and then six months later the bushing that you can't service goes bad or the ball joint that comes as part of the control arm goes bad. It just makes more sense, but they should be able to explain that. So if you're not getting that, maybe try one of the shops at bumper to bumperradio.com. See if you get a different result. I certainly hope you do. All right. Well, we've got Frank in Scottsdale on a 2004 Ford Expedition. Go ahead, Frank. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, thanks for taking the call. Uh, I've got a kind of an issue. I don't know if it's probably in the suspension, but when I get up in the morning and get in my car and drive it, I don't have any noise, no squeaking noise, nothing. And then once the temperature gets above 50 degrees outside, I've got a major squeaking noise in the left rear. Hmm, Dave. Well, I don't know what you're thinking. As soon as you said left rear, you took a sharp left turn. Look at me, like interesting. Oh. <laughs> I just woke up. I was daydreaming. <laughs> Expedition is that? They doesn't have airbags in them, right? They're just leaf spring in the back. It could have an air, an airbag in the back, but I, but I doubt it. You know, I, at first I was thinking maybe a sway bar bushing mm-hmm. or a sway bar in link. So tell me a little bit more about that noise, Frank. Does it do it when you're going over bumps, just driving down the road, or or what's it happening? Kind of does, it kind of does both. It doesn't matter. Once it starts in the afternoon or after 50 degrees, you can hear uh, I don't hear when I have my radio on, but once I turn my radio off, I can hear it no matter what I'm doing. And it's, is it a revolutionary squeak? So is the, the faster you go, does the squeak change at all? No, like, no. Basically, when I'm uh, when I roll bumps in the road or steep bumps, I might and stuff. Okay. okay. I'm well, thinking like a rubber bushing. Usually, they're noisier when they're cold, though. Yeah, that that doesn't. I don't believe that doesn't have a leaf spring style rear suspension. So, a rubber bushing possibly. And, and what we might do to find that is just spray them down. Go and and spray them. Now that doesn't necessarily fix, but if we can stop the noise with some silicone spray, you, you really don't want to use WD-40 or any any. Uh, petroleum-based product because it will, can make the rubber bushings and such swell up. But that would be the first area I'd be thinking about, Dave. It's just putting some silicone spray very on specific components. So let's try two or three of them at a time 
and see if the noise stops or changes. And that's literally what we're doing in the shop. We put it on what we call a drive-on hoist, so the weight of the vehicle is on the tires. And we have a guy that's pouncing on the bumper and a guy standing underneath, you know, sticking his ear up to components and seeing which one's making the noise. That's what's going to be. Stethoscope or just some way right. to, to find it. Spray them. it down because you want to know which one's making the noise. So spray them down one at a time, and then you can see what goes away. Well, you know, and, and – to carry that on a little bit, I think a, a mistake that a lot of technicians make when they're doing suspension repairs, they lift it up on the rack, so that makes the suspension sag down. And let's just talk about the case of the control arm bushing. Everything is sagging down. You bolt up the new parts, you tighten them down, and then you lower the car. That's the wrong way to do that because now you tighten that bushing and you bound that mm. bushing up in its maximum position. You're pretty smart. I did so, not know that. I am occasionally. <laughs> Just ask me. I'll tell you. <laughs> so so when, when technicians are, are, are doing suspension work, they need to snug these things up and then lower the car, support the car, use a, a – we call it a, you know just a tall jack stand – and, and and get that suspension in its normal resting position and then tighten everything up. Man, all the work I've done on suspensions, I never thought about it like that. But it, but it makes a little bit of sense. It's not, it's not a huge degree of difference, but it, every little thing helps for s- successful repair. It's the difference of taking five or ten more minutes and doing that or being in the production line and blowing and going as fast as you can because <laughs> you've got to blow this stuff out. It's taking the time with your customer's car. Well, we're going to go with Ron in Peoria, who's been ever so patient on a 2002 Buick Rendezvous. Go ahead, Ron. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yeah, here's what uh, here's what I got. You know, I got a 2002 Rendezvous, and uh, I got the uh, the uh, intake manifold gasket is leaking, and the mechanic showed me where it is. Okay, so that's not a cheap repair. But uh, my question, the other thing I have is uh, I have a it's a it's a uh, uh, all wheel drive vehicle, and I got the light for oil uh, uh, all wheel drive. Uh, is not uh, functioning, and uh, he detected that it's a differential oil flow check valve. Now, just to keep them honest, I went to the dealer and found out what the price on this puppy is, and I thought, my God. I said, well, where the hell is it? You know, they got to take the axle out or what? And he goes, no, uh, it's uh, actually something you can unscrew and put back in, but it's still going to be $410 uh, for me through the dealership. And I thought, you know, it's a check valve. Can't I remove that and clean it and put it back in? Or is that something that's not serviceable that way? Well, Ron, I'll let Dave take the uh, the, the question on the differential check valve, but I want to address your intake manifold gasket first. When you do that intake manifold gasket job, ask that technician or the service provider, what else should I do while I'm doing this? Because someone can go in there and just take the intake manifold off, clean the gasket services, put it back on, change the oil, and refill it with coolant. Your car is roughly 12 years old. Maybe it's around 80 to 100,000 miles or so, depending on how you drive. We're usually going to talk to people about now's the time to do X, Y, and Z. If you got over 100,000, let's replace the spark plugs while we're in there. It makes it a little bit easier to get the back spark plugs. You want to flush the cooling system for sure when you, when you do that intake manifold job. What about the spark plug wires? That We have to take them off of the car. Take advantage and buy the parts now. There should be no more extra labor to do that. So ask them, what else should I do? What else makes sense to make this a whole job? And then, Dave, what do you think about the, the check valve differential? Check valve, deal? solenoid, whatever it may be. To be honest with you, I've never ran across that exact thing. So to know whether you could pull it out and clean it or work on it or something like that, it would just be a trial and error thing. I would think if it was in my shop and I knew that component was bad, I would try that first. Maybe even before I called you back to sell you another one, I would say, hey, well, let me just unscrew it real quick and see if there's something that can be done here without having to, to buy the component because I would probably call and price out the component and say, wow, seems like... And An expensive on, little piece, but, you know, we're it, talking about a $35,000 vehicle, too. It also depends on how it fails. If it failed electronically, if it's a solenoid or a check mm-hmm. valve that's controlled by a computer or by a module, cleaning doesn't fix bad electronics. I've nope. never taken a light bulb down and washed it off and made it work again. <laughs> so, so that You're won't, full of it today, man. That, Chimneys and light bulbs. I got my analogy. So <laughs> that, that won't help, but it certainly wouldn't hurt. But then again, when you're in a shop at $100 an hour... You spend 150 bucks cleaning a $400 part, it, and it doesn't work. It, it just may not be worth it. I just have a, you know, I just have a, 
this is a point that's changed in our automotive business. In the in the old days, labor was cheaper, you know, and uh, parts were more expensive. It seemed like, so we could do more of that. We used to put on CV boots. Remember that we do CV boots, and now we just buy a whole axle with two new CV boots and two new joints, and it doesn't. It's not cost effective to go replace the boots. You might as well just get a whole new one. The grease has already gotten out. The dirt and grime's already got in. Get another one. Yeah, it by makes, the t- by the time you put a boot on, you've only fixed half the axle. But we were doing boots when we were at sixty bucks an hour, you know. Yeah. And and now that the average, I think the average in in Tempe is like hundred and ten bucks an hour. That's the average, you know. So that means some are at one twenty and some are at ninety eight. But that's the average of all of them. So now we got to consider the time. And so that's, that is a big expense. So I did want to address our email of the week. We got an email of the week from Terry in Virginia. Uh, and they live, I believe, in Globe, Arizona. And they drive a 2004 GMC 2500. And uh, she said, hey, we're, we're on a fixed income. We're retired. We drive this truck 250 to 300 miles and... Lights come on, and the transmission is stuck in one gear. And so we've got a code reader. We scan because my, you know, she said her husband was a diesel mechanic from back. You know, he's got a code reader. Plugs into it, sees a P0700 code, which is the definition is transmission control module. That's what the definition is. So they jump online, and they get on some sort of tech line, GM tech line online. And the diagnosis is... It's kind of like us. They'll give you a diagnosis, but you got to pay them 50 bucks to get, <laughs> to get it, right? <laughs> Our free information isn't worth anything because it's free. <laughs> no, but so she did. They, they went to this tech line and they said, go ahead and replace the transmission control module. That is the problem. So they went and they bought a $1,000 transmission control module. They went and they drove 250 miles. And guess what came back? The P0700 code. And the reason I wanted to make a point of this, and she's going to come down and see me on February 5th, and we're going to diagnose this thing. A lot of these code readers that you can get for personal use are very, very generic. Mm -hmm. They'll scan one module, which is the main brain of the car. P0700, by definition, says, hey, there is a problem at the transmission control module. Their number is 602-277-5827. Call that module and see what that module says. And then we're going to go over to that module, and that module is going to tell us something else that the main one, it's not really focused on that. It just knows something's going haywire over at that other place down the street So, or, but, or down in the different section of the car. So I get that you know, people want to save money and they don't want to spend money on diagnosis. But in this case, this may be a case where we spent a thousand dollars we didn't need to spend because we were trying to save some money. So when we come back, we're going to take Lisa, Pedro and Brad. You're listening to Bumper to Bumper Radio. Well, welcome back to Bumper to Bumper Radio. I'm Matt Allen. He's Dave Riccio. Together, we're the KTAR car guys. Uh, help with your car. Anything you want to talk about with your car, we can help you with that if you want to get involved with the show. Play with us a little bit. 602-277-5827-602-277 KTAR. And you know, I hear this is a sports station and on the other side, and I always hear the pitchers and catchers report in 20 days. And but you know what? I don't care because today <laughs> gentlemen are starting their engines at uh, the 24 hours of Daytona. So if you want to see some of this cool technology in your car that's a I mean, it's a 24 hour race around the clock four drivers in a car typically uh dave's Net- rolling his eyes but that's <laughs> my passion i like sports car racing and uh you know our friends at bondurant they've been on the on the show before a couple of times the coo darren law is uh actually driving the car that's on the pole for the race so good luck to darren and hopefully uh i'm gonna go home and watch see i can sit in front of the tv now they're going to have like 20 hours of coverage on various uh, Fox News and Fox Fox Sports Channel, Fox <laughs> Channel 10. I'll be just – I'll wake up at 3 in the morning to watch the watch the. He really the is tomorrow. a car guy through and through. You know, he's got uh, custom-made uh, toilet paper that says NASCAR on it. <laughs> nah, I don't care so much about NASCAR. I like the I like the Indy cars and the sports okay, cars. Okay, he's got Indy cars on whatever. it. Whatever. <laughs> but he's got pictures of race cars on his watch. I mean, his watch. I mean, come on. Come on now, come Dave. On. You're exaggerating a little bit, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> We're going to go with Pedro in Avondale on a 2001 Chevrolet Malibu. Go ahead, Pedro. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Yes, I got a 2000 Chevy Malibu. It's uh, my son's car. Um I we rebuilt the engine a couple of years ago and we bought it with a damaged engine and 
Uh, it's running fine, the engine runs fine, but the problem we have is uh, on the transmission, uh, you're going down the road and you feel like a, a little hesitation and go kind of upshift, downshift, upshift, downshift, but it doesn't do it all the time. It's just uh, when it's kind of pulling up like a little hill or something like that. What speed are you going? Are you going 45, 50 miles an hour? Uh, those are the different speed. Uh, usually 45, 50, yes, when you're going cruising down. But I also notice that when I go to go to a, like an entrance ramp. To get okay, like a nice where... little incline? Yes. Okay. I, <clears throat> it's probably one of the most common things that we get at the transmission shop. I mean, if we could fix cars for misfires, we'd be, we'd be rich. You know, we don't generally do that because we work on transmissions. But a lot of what happens, and people describe it to me, the, the transmission's getting indecisive. It can't decide if it wants to go up or down, up or down, up or down, up or down. That's not actually the transmission doing that. The transmission is already in fourth gear. It's in torque converter lockup, and it is just along for the ride. But what's happening when you go that light incline, you know, the, the motor's kind of lugged a little bit. And that's when the misfires show up. And it feels like the transmission's hunting, but it's not hunting. I mean, I'd be I'd be 95% sure we're talking about an engine misfire under a light load as opposed to a transmission problem. Maybe even a, a, a mass airflow sensor issue? Yeah, yeah. Some, okay. something like that, but not transmission. So, uh, yeah, I would say that's it. Thanks so much for the call, Peter. We are going to go with Scott in Phoenix on a 95 Supra. Go ahead, Scott. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, I was just wanting to ask a few questions. Um, I had a head gasket go out in this Supra. It's a 2JZ motor, and I'm I'm not really a mechanic. Uh, I trade, so I didn't know if that's something really deep that I should maybe see a mechanic about or if that's something I could handle on my own. I've been real skeptical as to breaking it open and trying to replace that head gasket, but I wasn't sure what else I was going to get into. What part of Phoenix are you in? <laughs> I, I live in Maricopa, but okay, Maricopa. I'm right in downtown Phoenix. If you don't feel like you're uh, mechanically, that's your thing, I think a head gasket is not the one to learn on. Yeah, I mean, you, that's, that's a big job. That's a big bite to take. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, First, I want to make sure we know we have a blown head gasket. And then doing that job yourself, that's, that's a, everything has to go right. You've got to get things perfectly cleaned. You've got to get that head out to a machine shop to make sure no damage occurred. No, build and check for cracks. Yeah, it makes sense to do a valve job on the car. So, yeah, that's going to be something you're going to want to take to somebody that's got the experience to do that job and get it done right. Because if you do it wrong and something goes wrong, it can go wrong big time. And then you're in deep trouble. Hydro lock a motor, then you're buying a whole motor also. So we're going to go with Brad in Phoenix on a 2012 Chevrolet Tahoe. Go ahead, Brad. You're on Bumper to Bumper Radio. Hey, guys. Um, during the July and August of the humid months uh, this last summer, my Tahoe was blowing a lot of steam. And I took it to the dealer, and they didn't really didn't know what was going on. And So I didn't get anything fixed. Is there anything to worry about? Steam like uh, up on the uh, up on the windshield type of steam? No, blowing out of the vents. Yeah. So when my AC was on, you know, during the hot, humid days, I would get a lot of steam coming out of my vents. Well, what I wouldn't worry about too much. and Probably maybe what you were doing is running fresh air, and so you were taking the humidity of the car, bringing it in over the over the cooling coil or the evaporator, and you were freezing the, the moisture. I used to have a 280Z. Man, that thing would blow. It would literally... Throw ice like little teardrops of ice would be blowing out the center vent because the AC was so cold. So, I bet it's not steam. It's 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 uh, like putting the dry ice in the pool, swimming pool or something. It's just the cold air and the vapors. I would run it on recirc, mm. where you're recirculating the air inside the car and not taking in the fresh air from outside. And that's probably what that was but i think it's also just a sign that you've got darn good air conditioning darn in the car. good steaming up the windows of the tahoe <laughs> exactly um dave we're you know the the topic today was fuel injection cleaning engine engine decarbing i think is is really the the term that we want to use we're not flushing injectors and we talked about a lot about what causes these problems 
when you need to get them cleaned, maybe as early as fifteen or 20,000 miles on certain cars like minis and... and direct uh, injected cars. Direct injected cars. You really want to be looking at them. You won't find in very many, many owner's manuals where it says clean the fuel injectors. It's just not there. But they need to be done, trust me. But what we are starting to see, and I saw it in a 2012 owner's manual for, a, for a Hyundai... It says every 7,500 miles that you've got to use a fuel system cleaner in the gas tank. And if you've listened to this show very long, you've heard me say I think most of those are junk. You can go. One of our early shows, Dave, we went to AutoZone and we looked at, I mean, there's 100 different cleaners on the wall. Techron from Chevron. That's probably the most common and easy one to buy yourself. Put that in the tank. You can use a product from BG. Most That's used at professional shops. You probably can't find that anywhere. There's another product called Seafoam and another brand called Liquimoly. I think those are the best ones, along with using a top-tier fuel. And if you search top-tier fuel, there'll be more explanation and more than we can do over the radio, along with some pictures probably, to learn some more about that. You could also follow up at bumper to bumper com on the contact link if you do have any questions about what your car needs, you know, what's custom for you. Um, not There's not a one-size-fits-all for every type of vehicle. Thanks for joining us. If you're looking for a great shop to start a relationship with, like Matt over at Virginia Auto Service or David Tri-City Transmission, there's a bunch of hand-picked shops at bumper to bumper com. While you're there, be sure to like us on Facebook. Thanks, Peter, for running the dials. Remember never to text and drive. From all the shops at Bumper to Bumper Radio, we hope you have a blessed weekend.